With that, I am now going to open us up with prayer, and then we'll see if there is uh, there are other things that you would like to talk about today. Um, so, welcome on this Tuesday, October 29th. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we are again grateful to have the opportunity in this free country to come together to study Scripture, to be with one another, to enjoy this fellowship, to enjoy this opportunity to dig deeper into your holy word and to talk about the thoughts and the questions that are on our minds and our hearts um, about your scripture and you and your son Jesus Christ and the good news. And we just pray that you will fill us with lots of wisdom and discernment this morning. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> okay, so... Is there anything y'all would like to talk about before we get started? Mr. Hess. I would just like to say I really, really enjoyed your class on Sunday. Oh, yeah. Well, good. Really good. That, good. That graphic you had was fabulous. You mean of the Big Bang? The Big Bang. It, yeah. it, I, you know, after I looked, worked on it for a while, I understood why it got an award that I didn't even know existed on Wiki. I guess certain diagrams they view as being so helpful that the community gives them this award. And I, I do think that's one of them. It was very helpful to me to, to see better what, what we're talking about when we come to the Big Bang. Well, does it bring up a lot of questions? Well, sure it does. And, and, and you talk about these, these things like the Big Bang Theory or Einstein. I mean, it's, we all do the best with it we can. Even for the bona fide, absolute, spot-on geniuses like Richard Feynman, you know, they'll tell you it's, it isn't something you really understand. It's not intuitive. It is, a lot of it isn't even logical. But the math proves it. And every experiment has supported the math, even though you would think it's a crazy idea, right? So, so all of the observations and all of the experiments since in the last hundred years have gone to support the fact that Einstein got it right, that equations work, that even the quantum world, which kind of freaked Einstein out, actually does work. And you can, they can observe it in these big particle accelerators. So we all do our best to understand. But even if we, I don't know any of the math, I can't do that in that stuff. But I do understand the question, can you get something from nothing, right? And if there is something, how is there something? And the answer we offer to the world is the true answer, is that there is a God who simply has always been and is not created, is now and forever shall be. And so, anyway, very good. Yeah, it was real intriguing, and this week we're going to talk and make sure we all understand Darwin. You know, Darwin's a little easier because Darwin doesn't depend upon math, so, which is really good. <laughs> Funny, you know, I was, always, I was always really gun-shy about math until I finally had been through college, and I was in the Air Force, and I was taking night classes at Arizona State, and I took one on statistics. And I just loved it. First time I'd ever loved a math class in my entire life. Yeah, yeah. I think because it was very different than anything I had been exposed to, and I was simply older and more mature. Maybe it's that, you know. So anyway, anything else you would like to talk about except my personal life history? <laughs> yes. Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26. Right, so it is in, in, in the opening chapter of Genesis, God speaks in the plural, okay? And there are disagreements about how to interpret that plural. 
for Christians, we might see it as Trinitarian. Certainly, ancient Jews would not. Um, some see it because of how old it is, how old the writing is, that, the, that it's an expression about the heavenly counsel of God, which you encounter at various times in the Old Testament, including like the beginning of the book of Job and so forth, that there's a heavenly counsel that God has. It could be the we. Some will say it's meant to be more like a royal we. You know, which one do I lean toward? I lean, I, I, I actually don't lean toward it being a little clue to the Trinity. I just lean toward it being this heavenly council. It's the way the ancients understood how things were put together, okay? And from your Bible from beginning to end has God, humans, cows, trees, and the rest, and then an order of spiritual creatures, right, that are not human and not divine. And um, so from the pretty much the beginning to, yeah, from the beginning from Genesis 1 to Revelation, there is a heavenly council around God, right? And so I don't know. That works for me. Maybe it'll work for you. But a good question, good question. Anything else I, can, I might be able to help with? Okay. Well, I believe we just finished up last week, Acts 23, and we are beginning Acts 24. Is that true? Okay, so what I want to do is to open my <laughs> Bible to the right place. Hopefully you can open up to the right place, Mr. Bible. Okay, so what I would like to do is just go back over it a little bit. Um, Paul has been moved maybe Paul has been moved from Jerusalem to the port, the Roman port built by Herod the Great called Caesarea Maritima and that's where the red arrow is pointing to. He's been moved by the Roman soldiers. Remember all that? Foot soldiers, cavalry, the foot soldiers went so far, then they went back, and the cavalry took them the rest of the way. It was all spiriting him out of Jerusalem in order to get him away from some Jewish mobs that wanted to do great harm to Paul, okay? And because they saw him as a blasphemer, going back to Jesus and the following first years when Peter and James and John were arrested, all of that is in that same line of Jews who are deeply, deeply offended by what Paul is saying. And so now he's up at Caesarea Maritima, and that's where the governor stays, the person sent by Rome to be in charge of all of this. At one time, it was Pontius Pilate. Now, years have passed, and it is a man named Antonius Felix. Okay, I'm going to talk about him more in a second. And so look at verse 20, oh wait, 33 of chapter 23. So we'll read in to the beginning of, of 24, okay? okay? Chapter 23, verse 33. When the cavalry, <laughs> I loved westerns when I was a kid, and the cavalry would come riding across the horizon to rescue the wagon train or whatever. Yeah, I love that stuff. When the cavalry arrives in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. That governor, we will get his name in just a little bit. Um, his name, as I said, is uh, Antonius Felix, we think. Um, the governor read the letter and asked what province Paul was from, because that might have something to do with who could hear the case. Learning that he was from Cilicia, which is up on the southern coast of uh, modern-day Turkey. He said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace, that a palace that Herod the Great had built, and he's been dead for half a more than half a century now, but he built a magnificent palace there at Caesarea Maritima, and that is where Paul is being kept because that's where Anybody who matters is staying in, when they're in Caesarea Maritima. So, <clears throat> verse 
let's talk about Felix. Felix is a really, really interesting person. We don't know much about him from Scripture. We know his name. We know he's married to Drusilla, um, his wife. But most of what we know about him we get from um, the Jewish historian Josephus as well as some Roman historians. The most fascinating thing about Felix is that he was a freedman. He had once been a slave and was now free and had risen to prominence. It's believed that he, because of his closeness to the family of the Emperor Claudius, that he was a slave of Claudius's mother, whom she freed and um, moved in those circles and aspired to big things in those circles and probably did control um, a large amount of wealth. I think he probably also was a very capable person. That, that would be my guess, to have emerged out of slavery into freedom and then parlay that freedom into this posting over to Galilee, which, which on the one hand wasn't a favorite place to be sent, but on the other hand, it was the eastern anchor of the empire at this time. The year we're talking about here, I, I look, got some opinions about this, including N.T. Wright's. It's probably about 57 A.D. at this point. You know, as I've explained, there's, there's not enough time markers to get everything down to the way we Westerners would like it in 2024, but probably around 57. Um, he... Felix was the governor from 52 to 60 A.D., right? So it's about 57. He is the governor of the place um, and the one who Paul is brought to because he is the representative of Caesar, right? He's the representative of Rome, and Paul has played his Roman citizenship card. Remember? There it is, Roman citizenship. So, now five, so there, now he's in, Paul is in Caesarea, and Caesar's holding him until the, uh, um, <laughs> the lawyers and the rest can get up there from Jerusalem, right? So now this is going to become a very lawyerly passage, what we're going to get to. And it's written in a way to emphasize that the way it's written, the way the lawyers talk are, are typical and common in arguments made before Roman courts and within Roman law. So, um, and, <clears throat> all right, so by, also by Roman law, the accused had to be present at the trial. There okay, could be any trials in the dark, you know, and you get, you get condemned by some star chamber or something like that, nothing like that. So. Um, five days later, chapter 24, verse 1, five days later, the high priest Ananias, remember him? That's, he's the current high priest in Jer Jerusalem, went down to Caesarea. I know it's a northwest, but everything flows down from, from Jerusalem in, in, the, in, a, in a religiously significant way. That's the way it works. So Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, okay? Just by his name alone, you can tell that he is versed in Roman law, okay? And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor, that's Felix. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. And here we go. This is the lawyer. How many lawyers are, do I have in here today? I've got to be careful. <laughs> Wait, are there no lawyers present? Or nobody admitting to it. Nobody admitting to it. Wait, what? What? Over here? Okay. Okay. What, what was it? It Was it in Hen, Hen, Henry V? When, when Dick says, what's the first thing we do in the rebellion? Kill all the lawyers. That's Shakespeare, not me. Okay. <laughs> 
Yes, yes, yes. Famous Shakespearean line. All right, so. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix, quote, We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix. We acknowledge this with profound gratitude. Is he laying it on thick? He's laying it on thick. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I, I, I read a bit about, you know, this forensic lawyering, lawyering in among the Romans, and they would tend to begin this way. You flatter the judge, who in this case is the governor. We acknowledge this with profound gratitude, but in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. The lawyer goes on, Tertullus. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. Now, don't, don't be thinking like he means like in these places he doesn't even know exists. Right? It's just a hyperbolic way of speaking, and this guy has been all over the place making trouble. And Paul has been all over the place in a general sense. Throughout Asia Minor, throughout Greece and Macedonia and the Peloponnese and stuff. So he has been really out there. I mean, he's been carrying the good news. Bobby's walked 10,000 miles at this point carrying that good news. He, Tertullus goes on. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. Now, isn't that interesting? I believe this is the only place where you find that sort of reference. The Nazarene sect. It goes to show a couple of things. That the, within Judaism, the Jesus movement is seen as a cult. Right? I like that better than sect as in terms of describing how it's, it's seen and how we use these words today. Um, a cult. And already attached to it is the hometown of Jesus, Nazareth. So he is a Naz, it's a, the Nazarene sect, the Nazarene cult. And we're on, we're, 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 what? And time-wise, we are 27 years past Jesus' death and resurrection. You know, it's why if you encounter people who will try to start an argument about whether Jesus ever existed, just stop them because they're going to embarrass themselves. No, no reputable scholar has put forward the idea that Jesus has never existed for a hundred years. That argument is done. It's over. We have enough. Enough work's been done. Enough scholarly work done by skeptics. Um, I have a book on my shelf called Did Jesus Exist? And it's written by the most famous skeptic in America who publishes a lot of stuff. And he just says, sure, yes, it's, it's done. Let's, that, 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 that's a century-old question which has been settled. Okay? So, yes? Oh, I see, I glide. You notice how I glided over that? <laughs> because my Rolodex is coming up empty. Some of you have read his books. No, no, N.T. Wright's not a skeptic. No, oh, what's his name? When it pops into my brain, I will utter it, okay? Um, he's, a he's, a New he's a New Testament scholar who doesn't believe that Jesus was resurrected, doesn't believe that Jesus was God, who, yeah, um, 
Anyway, it hasn't popped into my head yet. I'm so sorry. It's just a function of I'm getting old as dirt, and the Rolodex, the Rolodex spins pretty slowly sometimes now. What? Cards get stuck. They're kind of falling out. They're getting torn up. Yeah. All right. <laughs> At least I have a Rolodex. <laughs> he, <laughs> okay. So go back to verse 5. He is the ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple, which we already know was not true. Right? These are the false charges that were brought against him in Jerusalem. There's no evidence for it because it didn't happen. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. Now what this is being set up as is, is, is a contest, really, but between Felix and the Jewish leadership. There had always been a great amount of tension between the Jewish leadership and the Roman governance, and um, this is being presented to Felix as this is what we, the council, says. We, the big dogs in Judaism, the, we, we are the ones who really run Jerusalem and these people that you are purporting to govern, and this is what we're telling you, and you just need to go along with it. <clears throat> By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all of these charges we are bringing against him. So now we find out that the other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were indeed true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation because he has been the governor for five years at this point. So Paul says, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that not more than 12 days ago, okay, so 12 days, he's going to walk us through these 12 days, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Remember, so he's coming off this third missionary journey. He has shaved his head or cut his hair, taken the vow, and, and, and just really trying to say to his fellow Jews, I'm not against you. I want to tell you the good news of Jesus. He is our Messiah, but I'm not against you. I'm one of you. I'm a Jew. I'm a Pharisee. I did not leave the team. I'm still on the team, right? I'm still on the team. And so he, 12 days ago, he went to Jerusalem to worship. Now my accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple, because it's not what he went there to do, or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. He was much less what can we call it? If you look at the, what we've already read, he was much less aggressive about that than he was in some of the places he visited, where he would go into the synagogue and he's... <laughs> then he gets beat up, and then he heads over to the town square and preaches it to the Gentiles. Verse 13. They cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the capital W way. This is a common, in, in Acts, a common way of speaking of the Christian movement, the Jesus movement, the, this Nazarene sect. And when he says that, just, just, take, just make this part of your way your brain operates. He is not saying he left Judaism, right? What does he say? I worship the God of our ancestors. What God is that? It is the God who is, but it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who brought the slaves out of Egypt, freed them to the wilderness, and, and brought, 
them the law and the tabernacle at Mount Sinai and has been with them all lo, these many, 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 many centuries. I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which is a way of saying that, yes, I'm a Jew, I'm a Pharisee, I haven't taken one step backward in that. Jesus is our Messiah. God did step in to space and time. Yes, Patty? We have a question online Good. from Mike Kelly. Okay. I'm wondering why in this, in this particular point was Paul use the term the way? Be because it would be the common way to speak of the Jewish movement and <laughs> much more common than like the Nazarene sect, which the opposing lawyer said. So we've already went, went into the term, so I think it is just, it's just within these particular years that we're in right how now it was a common way to talk about um, these Christians as being the people of the way because the word Christian we've encountered it once before but it isn't it isn't commonly used people aren't throwing around the words Christianity and all that stuff yet that will come for now the more common one is the way that and and, and, and so let's so let's what Sure, sure, because I think that's what they all know the, the, the cult as. That Jesus is the Messiah. Is the people of the way being Jesus' followers, mm -hmm. proclaiming that he is the Messiah and more because he's God. And so, so why, would it be called, why would it be called the way? Because Jesus showed us the way. What does he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? He is the way. He's not just, you know, there is no other way. And so it's, so Luke calls it the way. And I presume Luke does it because other people are doing it, that it's not a Lucan invention. It's, it's because there is, think of it this way. What, when Jesus come, when Jesus came, and he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount and the other things that he did and telling the parables. What is he doing? He's talking to his own people, these fellow Jews, and saying to them, your way, which is being led by the priests and the Pharisees, it is leading you to destruction. You need to abandon that way which is what repentance is. Abandon that way and follow my way. That's what repentance is. Repentance is a, is a directional turn, like taking a Texas U-turn. So you're going to take a Texas U-turn away from the way of the bad shepherds of Israel, as Jesus calls them, and as they are called in Ezekiel, the leaders of Israel. And you're going to embrace Jesus and his way because he understands better than they who God is and what God wants from from us it's think about it in terms of the time that he heals a man um, on the Sabbath and is taken to task for it because that be, that's like doing work and you can't do work on the Sabbath so it's essentially saying that that man has to wait to be healed from, from after having been crippled for maybe his whole life. Is that really who God is? Is that really who Jesus is? You just wait. You know, we've got, yeah, yeah but just wait. You're going to make the Pharisees mad, so just go ahead and wait. No. You know, and then Jesus says, besides, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, Mark 2. So um, that's, that's what the way is. It is Jesus' way. And Jesus is fully, completely God, in addition to being the Jewish Messiah. But most of these Jews don't even accept that he's Messiah. I can't even contemplate anything, anything else. So, let me finish the sentence. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way which they call a sect. That's why I use the word cult, because cult in our day has a stronger meaning than sect, stronger sense, I think than sect, right? Cults, cults are feel filled with, I don't know what, weirdos? So, 
Yeah, I think so, kind of, kind of. So, um, so Paul is saying, look, you know, that's, that's what we have been relegated to in your minds, is we've been relegated to being a cult. But the truth is, I, a Pharisee, understand that Jesus is the one, and I am a follower of him. I'm a follower of the way, right? That way being Jesus' way, and Jesus is the embodiment of that way. He says, going on, I believe everything that is in accordance with the law. That is the law of Moses. Paul does not see himself as leaving the law behind. Neither did Jesus. Jesus said, I've come to fulfill the law, every jot and tittle. And it is taking the law and putting it in a big pot and boiling it down so you can get to the essence of all that stuff that's in there. And what do you find? You boil it down and you find Ten Commandments that, that express the heart of the law. And then you keep boiling it down and you find two, two commandments left at the very bottom of the pot after everything else is boiled away. And what are those? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Deuteronomy 6, Leviticus 19. So, so Paul says, I, you know, I, it, I'm still a Jew. <laughs> I'm still a Jew. I, I, I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men, pointing to the lawyer and all the Jews that are gathered there that have made the trip from Jerusalem, as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So that is the same issue he raised, right, when he was defending himself in front of the Sanhedrin. And he was skillfully dividing the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We talked about that last week. So that's not what he's about here because <coughs> he is firmly establishing himself in the middle of Second Temple Judaism in the year 57 A.D., though they wouldn't call it that, right? It is the year, you know, what? The third year in the reign of whoever succeeded Claudius, and I don't remember his name. So, wow, okay. Now this righteous, this resurrection of the righteous and wicked, that is a fundamental Christian doctrine. We didn't invent it. It came from the Jews. The Jews believed in the resurrection of the dead. Everybody, Jew and Gentile, Roman and Syrian, City folk, country folk, everybody, the righteous and the wicked. That is the same thing you see expressed in Revelation chapter 20 when you get to the point of the great resurrection. Everybody is raised. Everybody's names are read from the book of merit. And then you see whose names are in the book of life. That's the way it works. It's everybody. And it's, it's not a Christian innovation, and it's not a belief that Christians have ever had a great heresy come up around. We've had lots of, lots of heresies. Heresies are not simply mistakes, because we all make mistakes. A heresy is something, a mis uh, an error that is so, so significant that it undercuts the very existence of the Christian faith. That's what a heresy is. It, it is, and it is, an, it, it is a, an internal term. I'm a Christian, so I could be a heretic. I can't be a heretic be in Islam because I'm not Muslim. So, so a heresy is really something that arises within the faith and um, is a mistake so profound that if followed, would completely undermine the faith. And not surprisingly, all the great heresies arose in the first, let's call them, four or five centuries 
after Jesus. And they all focused upon Jesus, upon the claim that Jesus was not only Messiah, but God. And how that interplays with this proclamation of the triune God. But around the resurrection of the dead, no. No great heresies. Just old people, I think a lot of Christians forgot about it. But there was no great heresy that arose about it. That's, those are two different things. Yes? The topic of heresy. So, <coughs> as a preacher, a teacher of this faith, our faith, as a teacher and preacher of this faith, <coughs> from the pulpit, yes. was to say <coughs> there is no resurrection. Is that heresy? Yes. Okay. And foolishness. Right, so if, if if you know it would be it it, it would be it would. <laughs> there was a infamous Methodist bishop named Sprague, who denied the truth of the resurrection. And really, the response to someone is, "Well, why do you call yourself a Christian? It's such a fundamental part." Of the Christian faith, why do you, why do you do that? It 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 is the it is the linchpin. It is on which everything hangs on the truth of that claim. Because if Jesus wasn't resurrected, then forget it, forget everything else. It, if it's like oh, an interesting little spiritual metaphor, you know, no, it happened. If it didn't happen, then we could all find better things to do with our time, okay? Right? That's what that's, Paul says it plainly in 1 Corinthians 15. If Jesus was not resurrected, then we are to be pitied most of all. Why? Because we would, we've believed a lie. And Paul is not a man who wants to believe a lie. So, yeah. So that, I guess he's probably dead by now. He just should have said, look, I, I just don't believe anymore. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop calling myself a Christian. So another hand back here. This was a long time ago. I don't even think the man's alive. But yes, no. Was he removed from his position as bishop? No. That, my friends, is where the United Methodist Church found itself for the last 20 or 30 years. More and more things like that. And it's why so many of us are glad to not be part anymore. Right? That we ever, it's, it, God bless them, they're my Christian brothers and sisters, but <sighs> it's wonderful to have an open mind. But if your mind is so open that it can't close on anything, then openness has no meaning. Right? If anything goes, then it, everything goes, and just whatever. Whatever you want to think about Jesus fine, fine, just use a couple of the right words. It doesn't really matter what they mean. No, it does matter what they mean. So some of us, are, I'm going to say, I, I don't know what I want to say. <laughs> so the staff here at St. Andrew is committed to keeping us orthodox, keeping us committed to the historic Christian faith that has been handed down to us and as expressed in the pages of Scripture and the creeds. It's why we do the creeds, because the creeds are all, they come out of Scripture, and they are ways of affirming these most fundamental truths that Christians, um, that constitute the Christian faith. So, and the resurrection is always part. The resurrection of the dead. It's just that for a long time, people forgot about it. But now, you know, I, for one, have been working on this at St. Andrew for 20 years. And I, many, much, much higher percentage of people at the church understand that when they say the Apostles' Creed and they get to the end where we say we believe in the resurrection, that you're talking about themselves. Because they already talked about Jesus. That's earlier in the Creed. And when you get to the end of the Creed, no, that's us. So, wow, I'm getting wound up. Anything else? <laughs> 
You're so welcome. Okay. <laughs> All right. So one last question. Was Lazarus resurrected? No. Oh, I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> he was resuscitated. He, he, was, he was brought back to life. <laughs> See? 20 years ago, if I'd asked that question, almost everybody, everybody would have said yes. Right? So, yeah. So, Arthur, Lauren, me, all the rest of us, we're all committed to this path of living within and teaching and preaching the Orthodox Christian faith. Not the Greek Orthodox. Orthodox means the right um, the right teaching, the right doctrine, which we have inherited from those that came before us. It doesn't all have to be reinvented every generation. Okay, verse 16. So after he says, you know, I, uh, you know, I believe in, in everything that is in accordance with the law and the prophets and, and the resurrection, both of the righteous and the wicked, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. We've run into that phrase before. It means that he is, it's, it's a very, for, for these folks, it's a very community idea that his conscience is formed by the community um, and that he respects that and lives within that and strives to do the right thing of this God-shaped community that he is part of and his conscience is clear that the, he has done that for well nigh well well more than 20 20 years at this point because he's probably met by jesus in 33 and by now it's 57 so that's so how long 24 years right by my math i don't trust my math so I, but i think that's right <laughs> So, okay, verse 17. After an absence of several years, because what was he doing? He was out spreading the good news. I came, to, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. Now, we know this also from his letters, particularly 2 Corinthians, where he got talks at some length in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, 10, that he has been out going around the eastern end of the empire collecting money to take back to the poor Christians in Jerusalem. And the question is why? Is it merely an act of compassion, as wonderful as that is? No, it is not merely an act of compassion. It, for Paul, it is a way to unify the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians. Because in the eastern end of the empire, the ma vast majority of people that he is going to meet are going to be Gentiles, not Jews. So this is largely money from Gentile Christians that he has carried back to Jerusalem to help out the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem and hopefully thereby since, you know, what's the old saying, money walks, right? Yeah, to help, to help bind them together. That was as true then as it is now. Yes. From the west, like in Corinth, well, okay, like in, story, that he brought it back from the, west from the west to the east. It's like he brought it back from Corinth and yeah. Athens and the places in Asia Minor, wherever he's been able to get them, you know. And the most detail we get about the collection is from Corinth, is around Corinth, and it's where he basically tries to, <gasps> shall I, shame them into giving, saying, "Look what they did up in Macedonia." Surely you can do as well. And it wasn't just money, it's his other offerings. Yes, but, it, but it's, you know, what, what, what travels? Money, right? So, um, gifts to the poor and to present offerings. So, all right. Now, he says, I was ceremonial clean, ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. I guess, meeting with people and sharing what he had brought back. 
He's ceremonial clean, ceremonially clean because of the vow he had taken and the, what he did with his hair, and right? So he's just recounting what we will already know from what Luke told us. He said, there was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance, but there are some Jews from the province of Asia, that is Asia Minor slash modern-day Turkey, who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. If we went back a few chapters, who were, where, were, where were the troublemakers f from who actually did cause trouble and actually bring these false charges against Paul? They were from the province of Asia, which Paul had been to several times, different places up there. And he, he made some, some enemies. That's, that's how it is. Verse 20, or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence, quote, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. As if that's really it. That isn't really it. That wasn't really it. But that is a dividing point, as I said last week, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So Paul's defense is basically what? I didn't do it. You're not going to find witnesses who, really, who can come forward and testify that I did these things. They didn't before the Sanhedrin. They're not going to do it now. And who does that sound like? That sounds like Jesus before Caiaphas, right? There are witnesses, but they're liars. Right? They're, not, they're, not, they're not telling the truth. So Paul is falsely charged as Jesus was falsely charged. Remember I said a way, something to look for are the parallels in the stories. That's something purposeful by Luke, I think, to, to try to bring that out for us. Okay, well, that's interesting. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way. Well, that's fascinating. <laughs> Is it not? Yeah. Yes. So Felix has been intrigued by this whole Jesus stuff. And I, I, I personally think Felix was a very talented man to have come out of slavery into freedom and then end up as governor in this troublesome province for, for five years, eight years, actually. So I, um, but he has been doing his own research. You see this in other writings from a little bit later time, early in the second century, where People are writing letters to the governor, or the governor is requesting more information about what is this Jesus stuff is all about because the number of people that are coming to the movement is growing. Now, Rodney Stark, there's a name I remember. Don't ask me why. <laughs> He's a sociologist and a historian who said, now understand that probably by the end of the first century, there were his number is 7,000 Christians, right? Because it's growing maybe 40% annually or something, but it takes a long time to get to the number, get to a big number if you start at zero. So, so it, it's, a, it's a small movement, but a significant one, and one that captured the interest of this Roman governor. Because there's something that makes Luke say um, that he was well, not even somewhat acquainted, well acquainted with the way. Just fascinating to me. Yes? His what? His na name is probably Antonius Felix. Felix is probably more like a last name or, you know. 
um, Rome? If he was a slave in Claudius's family, then yeah, Rome. I don't know. I think as I think we have a historian who tells us that his father was as well. So Rome from the Italian peninsula, yeah. Well, then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. And here's what he says. When Lysias, the commander, comes, so now we have a name to put with the commander, right? The Roman, the Roman dog, the one, top dog, the one who's in charge of the centurions. When Lysias, the commander, comes, I will decide your case. Okay? And he ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. You know, they didn't really run prisons like you think of prisons and stuff. They, jails were just holding places until you were tried, and if you were going to eat, it was because your friends brought you food. State didn't view it as their responsibility to look after you for some interminable period of time. But it gave Paul freedom. So what is it like? It's probably more like a house arrest kind of thing. You know, you're supposed to stay there. Um, you've got some freedom, but, you know, there's prob I would guess there's probably a Roman guard there you know, with wherever Paul is staying. Um, and presumably, I think, probably still in the palace. So, verse 24. Now, several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. Well, isn't that interesting? So, let me tell you something about Drusilla. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Drusilla. <laughs> okay, here's the deal. I'm going to read this. I copied it out of the Anchor Bible Dictionary. The only information Luke provides about Drusilla, the wife of Felix, is that she was Jewish and with her husband, and with her husband when Paul shared the gospel with them. Drusilla's story, including how she came to be married to the governor, provides some useful background. Drusilla was the youngest daughter of Agrippa I. Now, Agrippa, you met, if we went back to Acts 12, you remember there was this king, Agrippa I, who blasphemed God and then was struck dead in 44 AD. That's him. She is his youngest daughter. And the sister of Agrippa II, her brother, right? Her brother, got dad's <coughs> throne, top job, and Bernice, another sister. Bernice. <laughs> Patty's mom was named Bernice, but she called herself Dale. <laughs> <laughs> known for her beauty, this is just Drusilla, known for her beauty, an initial engagement arranged by her father failed after his death, A.D. 44, Acts, I think it's 12, when her future husband reneged on his agreement to convert to Judaism. Ha-ha! He said no, and she said yes, and he said no, and she said yes, and then... Psh. She later married Azizus, king of Syrian Amisa, in 53 A.D., after that guy's circumcision, this king, all I can tell you is, <laughs> she must have been a great beauty. <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong, men? No, no I'm not wrong. Yes, yes, they're all going up there, right on the wall. Now, Felix was so enthralled by Drusilla that he sent Jewish, a Jewish friend named Thomas, who claimed to have magical powers to convince her to divorce her husband and marry him instead. By, now, next line, by doing so, 
she violated Jewish law through adultery. All right? Yeah. She, she, because she did. She, she dumped that guy, and he's going like, oh, man, what, you know. Because, <laughs> yeah, she did. And so now, and so, and so she married Felix. You know, I guess maybe she was convinced of some kind of magical powers. I wouldn't be surprised if Felix also had a fat checkbook, you know, <laughs> that was part of this. So. No, I don't think so. No, I don't think I don't think there is any. Um, he was a freed slave <coughs> from Claudius's family. No. He was familiar with the way, but of course, even at this time, there are a lot more Gentiles in the way than there are Jews in the way. If you think about it, there are a lot more Gentiles in the movement than there are Jews in the movement across the empire. So, that's Drusilla. Wow. Back to verse 24. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Jesus Christ. Wow. As Paul talked about righteousness, as he talked about self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. So in my, um, you know, I grew up in North Louisiana among an ocean of Baptists, right? So, so I think Felix found himself convicted and he didn't like it very much. He didn't like the fact that he really felt God's call to repent and to not just study the way, but to become part of the way by putting his faith, you know, in Christ. So, wow. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now, you may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping <laughs> that Paul would offer him a bribe. <coughs> now, under Roman law, bribery was against the law, but it was very common, <laughs> which as far as I know is true of many, many, many cultures, and people just get more and more sophisticated about how to accomplish the, the bribery, right? And so, you know, like, you know, in our country, a hint of it is really can't be can't be used in a courtroom because it's going to be so hard to mask and cover up. I think Felix is probably just all out there with it. He's just waiting there for Paul to come and say, "Oh, here's something I have for you. You know, won't you please just kind of resolve this case in my favor?" Um, it was an important part of how people like Felix expanded their wealth, how they got, how they got rich. At the same time, so he's felt, I think, I read this as he felt convicted by Paul's preaching about the gospel and st stopped it before he could get through that and be comforted by the good news. And now he's just hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him, which probably says something to us about, what do you think? Maybe a lack of sincerity on Felix's part? So now we're sending for Paul and they could sit down and have little conversations and stuff, maybe talk about Jesus, whatever. But Luke tells us, what is he really after? Money. Money. A bribe. 
okay? When two years had passed. Notice that. Two years had passed. Making it now something like 59 something. Remember, I, it's not, there's no perfect timeline around this. Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. Okay, so somewhere on 5960, Felix is replaced by <laughs> Festus. Don't you just love that? I mean, it's just like so awesome. I can't ever come to this place in Acts and not think of gun smoke. <laughs> it's just, I just can't, I try, I try, I try, I try, but I just can't. I just can't. <sighs> when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, see, this, there's this struggle between the governor and the Jewish leadership, and it's always this back and forth. Felix wants to leave, leave in good favor with the Jewish leadership, so they're not calling up Caesar and saying, we are really glad you got that idiot out of here. Right? So he wants to grant a favor to the Jews, leave on good terms, everybody. So what does he do? He left Paul in prison. And now we have a new governor. And what do you think that means for poor Paul? He's going to star all over again. <laughs> so that we will do when we come back next week. Because that, my friends, is the beginning of chapter 25. <laughs> yeah. I think it meant that probably the commander did show up. And, okay, so I'll weave a tail. Do you want me to weave a tail here? Sure. The commander showed up. Festus had found out that Paul had actually come back from this missionary journey with some bags of money and decided he wanted them, right? And so he kept Paul there trying to get his hands on some of that money even though the commander had come. In other words, Festus changed his mind. That's my. That's the way I tell the, tell that tale. So if the commander find out what he then whom? Felix. Felix? No. Felix is the governor. Why was he waiting for the commander? He was waiting for the commander to come because whatever he did with Paul, he had to have somebody to turn him over to. So if the commander's going to come, then Felix will decide the case, turn him over to Paul, turn him over to Lysias, and off he goes. <laughs> I think that's why. That's the simplest for me explanation. I, I do have one question. Yes, Jim. It might not be the end of the day question. So Paul would say that he was still a Jew but followed the way. What about the Gentiles that converted to the way? Would they consider themselves to be an uncircumcised Jew? No. They would just be followers, followers of the way. Of the way. Right. So if you're a Gentile coming in, Okay, so think about it this way, to, to use your words. There was no such thing as an uncircumcised Jew. That's what Paul talks about in his letters when he talks about a, circ circ a circumcision of the heart rather than a circumcision of the flesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, anything else? Well, here, then I'll come over here. Freed slave. Probably they, he probably had citizenship. Yes. <laughs> I said glory and short answers more than I do, but yes. <laughs> Over here. <laughs> yeah. Except, ex I'm thinking he was yeah, yeah. Maybe, and then he saw, hmm, I got something else here, some money. Yes. But Paul had two years free. 
Well, yes, no indication it got anywhere yeah. with Felix, right? So hang on to that thought, Ken, for when, for the coming encounters. Because notice what is happening now in the book of Acts. The <coughs> action has slowed way down. No more traveling from here to there and here to there and meeting this person. Now it is the series of encounters with people in power and the preaching and the talking about Judaism, the way, Jesus, the gospel. So we're getting these presentations of the good news, um, more of it, the closer we get to the end of the book of Acts. So, anything else? Is that a hand up over there? Yes, Charles. You can still see Festus uh, on Gunsmoke. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gun Gunsmoke is one of those shows running somewhere at any time. So anyway, anything else? Okay, so don't forget, if you have the little glass parfait glass, take it to the back table. You should take home whatever leftovers you, there are from your glorious contribution to today's feast, all right? And I and all the members of the class thank all of those who did bring such a magnificent spread of food, and thank you to the ladies who got, us, got that whole thing going again. So have a happy Halloween, and we will meet next on Election Day which means we will wake up the next morning and there will be no political ads. <laughs> well, I don't know that we'll know who won, but anyway, there won't be ads. Let's pray. Uh, up, 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 up. We're going to pray. Let's, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are... You bless us in so many ways. Just so many ways. We just love this fellowship, this time together on Tuesday. And we just uh, pray that you will continue to carry us forward. Help us deepen our desire to understand your word, to become better readers of Scripture, um, not, not just for the intellectual enjoyment of it, but so that we can get to know you better and come to better understand what you have done in this world by virtue of your faithfulness, faithfulness to your people. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One, one second. Let me just turn these things off.